thanks Martina for organizing this. It's great to be here with, with all of you, uh, with Ed and Jesse and, and Martina, and thank you all for, for attending as well. Um, so yeah, let me share my, my slides. Um, So as Martin was mentioning, you know, uh, recently we've been, you know, we just actually posted, just posted the, this paper on the economics of density uh, for the general economics perspectives written with, with Gilles de Ranton. Uh, and they've written before really this COVID-19 crisis. So there's a bit uh, of it about disease uh, based on uh, past epidemics. Uh, but regarding the current pandemic, there's really just uh, like a postscript, a couple of, of paragraphs in the, in the conclusion about it. So uh, it's more about, you know, things that we've seen before, about the benefits and cost of, of density uh, coming from before the, this crisis. So we know, of course, that density has many benefits. It boosts productivity and innovation, it improves access to goods and services, uh, makes us build and, and move around in more energy efficient ways allows us to share amenities as well. Uh, but density also has costs, uh, partly uh, living in, in denser cities, moving around denser cities is more costly, but partly also living in cities, in dense cities, uh, makes you more exposed to pollution and right now also to, to disease. Um, so historically, of course, a pandemic spread huge cost of density, right? So just to steal from, from Ed, uh, he's much better words on this, you know, he's, He's uh, said many times that density has both angels and, and demons, and that perhaps uh, pandemics were the worst of, of demons in, in the past, right? So pandemics hit cities very hard for centuries, you know, from the bubonic plague to cholera, tuberculosis, the 1918 flu. And nevertheless, cities have not disappeared on the country. They have adapted to these pandemics, and urbanization has kept advancing at a very fast pace. Now, in the current pandemic, we've seen COVID-19 also hit very hard some very large dense metropolises like New York, London, Milan, Madrid. So this naturally raises the question of whether this is a step back to past times when pandemics were a huge cost of being in, in cities. Are the cost of density going to become uh, much greater than they were, say, a year ago? Uh, is the impact of, of uh, the disease really very different in dense cities versus smaller towns or rural areas? And how will cities adapt and survive to, to the current uh, crisis, right? So these questions are, are difficult to, to answer, partly because you know, we were just talking about this when we started the, uh, this meeting. It's actually very difficult to, to see still at this stage what's happening, partly because the uh, pandemic is still evolving. So what we're seeing still is the relatively early phases. So we're seeing the places that are being hit first, but not necessarily the ones that are going to be hit hardest at the, at the end of the day. Partly also because the data is still scarce, right? So uh, it's still being, being built. Uh, for instance, there's not been a lot of testing. Uh, testing that's been happening has reserved people with more symptoms. So it's certainly not representative of the, of the whole population and so on. Now this is changing and you know, here in Spain in particular, now for the first time we have actually quite uh, good data on how the uh, COVID-19 has uh, spread uh, to different places. So there's been a, a super-prevalent study of a representative random sample of the entire population uh, where uh, the statistical institute has selected this random sample. They've asked people to take a test and actually most people, uh, a large majority, have accepted to, to do this and in fact close to 90 percent have even taken a, a full blood sample. So they've actually done the least of type tests which are much more reliable. So we actually now we're starting to get a, a fuller picture of where uh, COVID-19 has hit the hardest, right? So uh, using the data that just came out these last few days, yesterday I put together this, this picture, which is actually quite surprising, right? So on the vertical axis of this graph, we have precisely the, the prevalence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in the population. So this is the percentage of people that have already been infected uh, and generated uh, antibodies. On the horizontal axis, I have a measure of density. In this case, it's not you know, a traditional measure of density. We could have people per square kilometer and will make a big difference. But this is a measure of density that I think is more relevant, both in thinking about 
uh, contagion, but also in thinking about also the good size of density like productivity explorers and so on, which is how many people does the average person have within a 10 kilometer radius of, of them, right? So this is what we call experience uh, density. So you can see here that Madrid and Barcelona, in fact, have a very high prevalence of uh, uh, the virus, uh, so much higher than the average uh, rate for the country of, of 5%. So Madrid is actually around 11%, a bit lower in Barcelona. But when you look overall at all of these places, um, the relationship is not very strong. And if anything, you know, the, the, the correlation is actually negative. Uh, and this is because you have this whole bunch of places there on the, on the top left, uh, which are rural uh, uh, or at least sparsely populated places that, can, that still have been hit by the, uh, the virus even harder than the big densities. Now, for those of you who are not very familiar with, with Spain, let me say that these are not suburbs of Madrid or, or Barcelona. These places are far away. So getting to Soria or Albacete, this is not something you would want to do daily for your commute. This is something that takes several hours. So people do go there for the weekend. So there are people from these places who live in Madrid and then go back home to spend the weekend in a second home. There are people from Madrid that have second homes there and go there as well. There are couples that work in different cities and then get together for the weekend. So there's actually quite a lot of travel between these places, but these are places that are far away and are not very dense. So this second diagram I'm going to show you, this is actually from a recent paper just posted a few days ago by Masoli, Matteo, Hernando, Meloni, and Romasco, where they also combine this uh, prevalence of antibodies data uh, with some mobility data, similar to the one Jesse has been using for the US. So this is based on, on uh, pings by cell phone applications that allow to see how people move around in the country. So now the vertical axis is still the prevalence of antibodies, but the horizontal axis is now the number of weekend stays either from people who regularly live in Madrid and went to each of these provinces on the weekend or people who live in these provinces and then went to Madrid on the weekend. And there now you can see a very a much stronger uh, positive uh, relationship where the places that have hit, been hit the hardest are actually these places that we saw in the previous diagram are not very dense uh, but are very strongly connected to Madrid, which is where the outbreak started in, in Spain. And in fact, if, if instead of just looking at these variables one by one and, and plotting these correlations, you do some kind of multivariate analysis, uh, you know, about 64% of the uh, variation, this is what this uh, study by Masoli and co-author shows, about 64% is explained by mobility and only about 3% by density, right? So, in the end, what this, what this suggests is that there's something that has changed with respect to past epidemics. Uh, we are much more connected these days. And this is partly uh, in the form of these big metropolitan areas being connected to the rest of the world. And this is part of the reason why New York, London, Milan, Madrid were hit first. Uh, this connection with the rest of the world uh, planted uh, the seed of the virus there early on. But then widespread mobility within the country also disseminates the virus very quickly to smaller towns and rural areas. So in the end, it's not the densest places that get hit the hardest, it's actually low density places that are well connected to high density cities that end up being hit the hardest. So why, why even harder? I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that mobility can make these places be hard hit as well, but why even harder than the big cities. Uh, this is something we don't know yet and I haven't seen any study on this, but so this is just, just a conjecture on my side. But I think it's probably a combination of those two things. I mean, on the one hand, this, uh, this kind of weekend trips are trips that tend to be more social in the sense that people go there and go out to restaurants and interact more and that may be part of what's going on. Uh, but also I think there's some kind of threshold effect in terms of social distancing. So when you're in a big city, you bump into lots of people, most of whom you don't know, and it becomes quite standard to actually do the last six feet of separation, right? To uh, cross the sidewalk when you are uh, uh, about to uh, go against someone or to wear face masks. Whereas in, in more rural, less dense places, you bump less frequently into people and when you bump into someone, it's almost always someone who you know. So this, this final six feet of separation is actually harder to do. And I think that may be partly what's going on. 
Also, I mean, these numbers are only about uh, people getting infected. They don't really deal with the consequences of getting infected. It may also be that in these rural places, health facilities are also not as well prepared. So in fact, the uh, health consequences of, of the condition of being infected may also be harder in less dense uh, and more rural places. So, you know, I wanted to start by that, just saying that although we have this presumption that density actually increases prevalence of COVID-19, that's not necessarily the case, or at least not as, stronger, as, as strongly as we, as we thought. But nevertheless, this doesn't mean that cities are not going to get hit hard by, by this pandemic, because even if there's necessarily more prevalence, cities do rely much more on uh, the interactions. Uh, cities do rely much more on this productivity spillovers, on this meeting other people. So in that sense, since we now require lots of social distancing to try to keep the disease under control, cities may get more strongly affected by this. And yet, I have the impression that, you know, I'm pretty sure that the need for densities will not go away. This is partly because although more, many of us are trying to work remotely as much as possible right now, this is not feasible in many occupations and, and sectors. And for instance, work by Dingle and, and Neyman recently shows this uh, for, for the US. Also, there are spillovers, right? So you may be working for a firm that's well prepared to work remotely, but if you're dealing with other firms that are not as well prepared, it ends up being very difficult. Also, even for occupation sectors where it's feasible, uh, teleworking is actually an imperfect substitute for face-to-face -face interactions, right? So, uh, you know, we see this, you know, when we, we, those of, of us who's, who have been teaching recently, you know, when you connect to Zoom with your students, this thing that you normally do of just, just scanning their faces when you're teaching, trying to figure out whether they're following or not, seeing where you need to stop, when you need to clarify something, those nuances are, are lost in, in Zoom, right? So as much as the technology has improved, it's still not the same as being face to face. But also I think even more importantly, uh, when we connect with, to, with, through Zoom or through Skype or whatever, it's something that we do on purpose with anything that we intentionally uh, seek. And much of what we get from being in this environment is actually chance meetings. It's, it's, it's a big DPD of, of uh, dense environments that actually also gets lost when we are, are teleworking. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, besides that also, uh, density is something that we seek not just for work, but also for, for amenities. And actually it's the people who uh, have a, a high stability to, to telework, right? Uh, the workers of uh, Twitter, who Dorsey has told they can actually keep teleworking for forever. Well, those are precisely the people who may not want to be in a remote rural area because maybe they can telework, but they may still want to go to restaurants and, and bars and meet uh, other uh, people like them, right? And, and Jesse's work with Victor Couture actually has shown that uh, amenities actually are a very strong pull for uh, young uh, skilled workers in attracting them uh, to cities. Also, you know, then cities are about interacting with people, but also uh, work by Bushel and, and Vorelich uh, shows that this is not so much about the quantity of contacts, but more about the quality of contacts. It's not that we don't, it's not that so much that we interact with more people in cities, but it's that we benefit more for these interactors because since we can interact with more people potentially, we become more selective about who we interact with and we end up benefiting more from each of those interactions. Finally, also in terms of hardship, and there's lots of people undergoing very strong economic hardship these days, urban opportunities are a very strong pull and that's been the case in past pandemics. It's also probably still the case in this one. So finally, just, just to conclude on this, uh, how will cities uh, adapt? Well, uh, we've seen in the past that pandemics have shaped uh, the built environment. This is something that, for instance, uh, Kodamina has been uh, working on and, and you know, things you know, from, from sewage and, and water treatment to urban parks, to the way uh, buildings are built. That's partly been shaped by past pandemics. Uh, the current pandemic is also forcing us to make at least temporary adaptation to cities. So many cities are trying to expand the space that reserved for pedestrians as opposed to cars by closing uh, highways, going close to cities, by uh, closing big avenues, by having more green areas. Now, it's possible that this changes may persist. I actually don't think that is very 
very likely, but certainly this might be uh, a nice cue to actually think about it at least and, and try to reserve uh, a bit more space for people relative to, to cars. And on the topic of cars, you know, we might expect that at least while uh, the pandemic is hitting strong, we might expect people to try to avoid subways and buses and try to take the car uh, more frequently. However, the issue of cars versus public transport is tricky because on the one hand, cars will seem safer to people, but on the other hand, people who take cars also behave differently from people who take public transport, right? Because when you take the subway, you have to incur some fixed costs. It takes some time to go to the uh, subway station uh, to wait for the uh, train to arrive. So once you incur that cost, you want to take as much advantage of that trip as possible. So people who travel by public transit tend to uh, do more focused trips. They tend to do everything close to their destination and they don't move around as much. People who go by car, they go to one place, they drive for a few kilometers and they stop another place and then another place. So they are much more likely to be super spreaders in a way, right? So that doesn't say that we will see less driving, we'll probably see more, but certainly it says that there's a tension between the private and the social. So privately, we may have an incentive to take the car more often. Socially, it may be a bad thing because it actually may make the disease spread more widely. Uh, finally, you know, there's an important issue, and that is that while we've you know, shown you some graphs at the beginning suggesting that it's not densities that are being hit particularly hard, we have seen that unequal cities, on the other hand, are being hit very hard. There's a much greater impact of uh, COVID-19, both in terms of health consequences, but also in terms of economic consequences for those people who have lower skills, lower income for minorities. We see that within cities, for instance, the work of Almagro and Orange Hutchinson for New York City neighborhoods, we also see that across cities, right? So very unequal cities matter more for COVID-19 than the very dense cities. Uh, so perhaps something that we should learn is that while we still need density and we shouldn't reduce the density of cities, we may try to address the inequalities of cities and then acting on that front may actually help uh, alleviate the consequences of this and, and maybe future uh, pandemics. And this is important, of course, for those who are being hit hardest by this crisis, for people who are maybe are not hit as hard, but still care. But even, you know, even, even for someone who might uh, not care uh, directly, it's going to be hard to escape the consequences. When you are in, you know, in an area where many people are being hit hard, wanted or not, it's going to get to you as well, one way or another. Right, so it is important for everyone to try to tackle this. And I think, if anything, if there's anything that we learn about cities from this crisis, is that trying to reduce these inequalities may actually help us deal with this crisis and also make cities more resilient for the future. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. You seem to be muted, Martina. One classic. Huh? Uh, one thing that we can do live, another example, um, in addition to looking at our students' faces, is give a round of applause. So that would have been nice if we had, could be able to do that. Um, I would be interested to hear your views on inequality, Ed. I think you've been a defender that cities shouldn't be um, sorry about that. Um, but I want to give a chance uh, to some of the questions that have been coming up uh, from the audience before Diego has to leave. And we have one, Matthew Nadring, uh, who says, while cities will of course remain important, is COVID presenting an opportunity for governments to invest in underdeveloped rural areas? For instance, government could support broadband, allowing firms to relocate to rural areas. Um, yeah, so there's there's certainly some cost. I mean, I'm, you, you can probably see I'm in some rural area now and, and still not have the best of the connections uh, today. So certainly those those things uh, do matter. Now to 
to what extent we can actually get uh, many activities to be done uh, remotely, however, uh, is something that, that's very, very limited precisely because, you know, density has advantages and, and also disadvantages. So certainly, you know, we will have to, looking at these numbers that I showed before about how some of these low density places are being hard hit, it certainly says we should think about, you know, the way, for instance, we provide healthcare to these places and making sure that there's enough facilities uh, nearby because when a big city is hit hard, you can build a, uh, an improvised hospital that provides temporary accommodation for the new cases. In rural areas, it's much more difficult to do those, those sort of things. So certainly there's, there's a, a need and a, and a reason for doing those, those things. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is not just something about providing some government intervention that we suddenly make it feasible to do the things that we normally do in cities in rural areas. We can facilitate that to some extent, but in the end, we still need cities and we will need to be able to see how we can adapt cities to keep them working as opposed to, to moving away from them, I think. Okay, great. There's another question that says by Roland Lyons, do you think that if implemented unconditional income supports would undermine or reinforce the tendency of people to go to bigger cities when looking for employment? Uh, I'm not sure it's going to affect as much the location, uh, the location decision. Uh, in terms of being in one place or, or another. I mean, provided, you know, this, this, uh, these policies are not implemented in a way that's, that's necessarily tied to a place of, of resident, right? And that has been having, uh, writing about this, this uh, local policies uh, uh, recently as well. So really what we don't want is to create distortions where you, to me, in order to get these guaranteed incomes, you need to stay put because you actually want to allow people to, to seek opportunities wherever they are. So as long as we decide these policies are that they're neutral, and I think they should be. I don't think they will have a strong effect in terms of making people locate in one place or, or, or another. But that's totally, you know, they are important too, especially at this, uh, at this, at this time. They're actually important. It's going to be something that that many countries are doing, and, and it's helping alleviate. Uh, so that's one of the, of the policies that's been quite in, important here in Spain locally. Uh, uh, flexible, uh, making uh, job pools more flexible has also been something that's been quite important in terms of keeping uh, uh, job relationships active as opposed to having people going into unemployment. And it's actually been very, very effective in terms of not having the unemployment right, rise too much. Now the difficulty is trying to ease the transition, but even that it's being made more flexible. So certainly that's another aspect besides some a guaranteed income that's actually helping a lot smooth the, the impact as well. Um, we have one question, Kian McLaughlin, would it be feasible for transit authorities to restrict capacity by restricting entry to, for example, subway stations? Yes, we'll have to, to figure out ways to do this, right? So one of the things we've seen is that in many places, actually, capacity has been reduced, right? Because not people, many people are using it, and maybe they want to discourage people from, from using public transport for a while. But of course, if you reduce capacity, then you make it more, more congested, right? So for a while, we're going to certainly have to find ways to make using public transport uh, uh, better, right? Some differences we've seen actually are already indicative of this, right? So a huge percentage of bus drivers in New York City have actually been infected. Very few bus drivers in Madrid have been infected. One of the differences is actually the physical layout of the buses. Where already before COVID-19, there was a, a transparent screen uh, of metacrylate separating the driver from the passengers in the Madrid buses. And I think that small change, that small difference, has made a huge impact in terms of, say, bus drivers, for instance, having a safer uh, work environment. Right. So there's small things that maybe we can do that may have a big impact in terms of making public transport is still usable and, and feasible as we as we try to move out of this lockdown okay probably i'll ask uh, one more question gary lynch is wondering you mentioned that some companies are extending their work from home provisions indefinitely do you think demand for central business district space may change as companies move to virtual offices um, or room renting 
I think we may see more what we what we've seen when cities have been hit hard, right? So after September 11th, we saw many firms setting up like secondary sites in places that they thought would be temporarily safer, but few of them have actually moved permanently away, right? So we, we saw firms having a secondary offices that could allow them to operate securely away from Manhattan, but they haven't left their uh, headquarters in, in Manhattan, right? And I think we will see probably more preparation in terms of uh, temporary uh, measures of being able to uh, to work remotely uh, when things are needed. We may see some of the meetings that are done in person being done remotely, uh, but I don't think this is going to be the end of central business districts. I think there are especially many activities that really require this regular face-to-face -face interactions, uh, and I don't think we're going to see central cities uh, die in, in any way. I 